please sit comfortably and then question and answer time. So some interesting questions. How do we explain not self? Here we have a being who was a bodhisattva, being born life after life and then became a Buddha. So what is reborn? So we were contemplating and meditating uh, today upon the subject of the apparent reality or the conventional reality and meditating more and more on the ultimate reality contemplating conditions and in contemplating conditions becoming more and more aware of the unconditioned that which knows conditions so conventionally there is these five khandhas there is a, and they have a relative reality there are bodies in this room everyone can see and uh, we have eyes, ears, nose, tongues, bodies, we have hearts, we have minds. The Buddha is saying that the ultimate truth is not self. And he's saying that if you have a close look, there isn't really a self there. So what we have is because of ignorance, we have delusion, we misapprehend the body and the thoughts and the feelings as a self. And this is a very deep habit and most people and uh, even animals are doing it. So we don't get very many reminders not to do that. Or we don't get many mirrors and many examples of beings that don't do it. But your good fortune, my good fortune, uh, we've born in a time where there are people who've realized this truth still in the world and the Buddha realized this truth and even in his day, uh, remember when he was walking from the Bodhi tree to go and teach the five disciples, people who've read the life of the Buddha and then he met one Brahmin, a wanderer, sorry, on the road and he said, you look radiant, who is your teacher? And he said, uh, I'm foremost in the world, I have no teacher, nobody can teach me, I'm the awakened one. And, and uh, that guy kind of shook his head and walk, walked away. It's kind of, uh, kind of uncomprehensible. <laughs> Tathagata, I think, is the word the Buddha uses when he describes himself, and it has an interesting meaning. It means thus come and thus gone. So it's interesting, and this is an interesting answer to this question. Well, at least that's what Ajahn Amaro told me it means. Some Pali scholars might disagree. Um, thus come, meaning having built all those Bharamis and uh, attained Buddhahood, and thus gone, having let go of delusion and attachment and, and having his last life. So, uh, the thing which is reborn is the Tibetans describe it the Theravadans are reluctant to uh, the Tibetans would say it's subtle consciousness the Thais would say the Chitta and, uh, but the really strict Pali scholars don't like that and, uh, but there are suttas that say consciousness is the bridge between lives fueled by karma. So, a type of consciousness anyway. And uh, the next question is interesting because uh, a person was saying that she saw a person after he died a few times and was practicing for him and he came and said thank you. So that's interesting, isn't it? And there's a lot, a lot of people have uh, experience of this, that recently after the death of somebody, uh, people dream of that person sometimes coming and saying goodbye, or sometimes confused if they weren't aware that they were going to die, sometimes asking for help. So, uh, but the body is already dead, so what is that? It must be consciousness. And uh, Anyway, it is the mind that gets liberated 
we know that much, not the body. And so it's the mind, let's just call it the mind, a part of the mind that moves between births. And so the question as a, a bodhisattva, being born again and again to become a Buddha, so it's important to understand even bodhisattvas have the aspect of right view where they're aspiring for liberation from conditions. That's right view. One has to, one has to want to be liberated from samsara to make one a Buddhist. Bodhisattvas also have this aspect of right view. One difference is uh, they want to take a whole bunch of friends with them. So the outcome is Buddhas are also liberated. So that's the outcome. The, uh, the desire for a bodhisattva is to be a Buddha. Now the Buddha attains liberation. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato. The enlightened Buddha. And then he has all those skills and all those qualities and can teach lots of people and train them. So uh, I hope that answers the question. Consciousness fueled by karma and with latent greed, hatred and ignorance. That's what's reborn. So the more we practice, the latent greed, hatred and ignorance is less and less. And then if one attains Sotapanna, a maximum of seven lives, because uh, the self-view has been seen through so completely that it can't be believed again. So you're already making less karma by not believing it, by knowing it as a view, by knowing it as an assumption, by knowing it as a delusion. You're not making the karma of believing it and being attached to it. So it's inevitable. We're letting go of it. And apparently Ajahn Buddha Tassa said it actually takes most beings about three or four lives. Very few take seven. And he said, uh, somebody asked him why, and he said, well, if you've got even a little bit of excrement on your finger, it smells. So that's uh, beings who've realized the unconditioned uh, not attached to hanging on to it longer than they need to. So, uh, earthy forest dhamma. <laughs> How do you direct your mind to contemplate or what should be done when you are in a calm, Peaceful state, relaxed, sitting like a block of wood. Now this is good, this is good actually. Sitting like a block of wood, your breathing has stopped and you see brightness in front of you. So this is a mind with some samadhi and you don't need to contemplate at all. When uh, whoever it is that's experiencing that, I'm happy for you. Uh, so this is one of the types of rapture is that you can feel dense and heavy, solid grounded. But if the breathing stops, what this actually means is the mind is pulling away from those sense spaces and pulling inwards. So there may very well be some subtle breath, but the, the mind isn't aware of it because it's pulling away, it's pulling deep inside itself. And then often what happens when, when people experience that, many people experience light at that time, and this is kind of the the brightness of consciousness just becoming apparent to the mind. So the thing to be determined actually when this occurs is afterwards to contemplate. So if ever the mind enters a peaceful state like that, you just allow it to be completely full of the peace and just enjoy it because you know how often is the mind not like that? And so when you finally get a break, it's like pressing the pause button. You know, it's okay to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, you can enjoy it. And uh, But then very important afterwards to contemplate not self, because the self can start to identify and you can start to think that you're a bright, radiant being. You've got samadhi. So it's dangerous and uh, you can develop uh, conceit around being peaceful. So after coming out of the peaceful state, the mind should have a lot of power and a lot of energy. And that's a time to have a good look at the body, what's a body. And 
because investigating the body leads to insights into not self. You know, after the peaceful state, okay, I'm going to try and find this self. Where is it? Have a look at the 32 parts. Is it in the hair, in the nails, in the teeth, in the bones? Is it in the blood? And you can't find it. And then this will balance that tendency towards getting conceited. But anyway, I am a little bit happy that somebody's experiencing that. And I won't embarrass you by making you hold your hand up. But please dedicate some of the merit to me. <laughs> because the, the Buddha says uh, to attain a, a peaceful state is uh, generates enormous amounts of merit actually. When the mind becomes truly peaceful it, it makes a lot of good karma. And dedicate it to all of your deceased relatives. So somebody's asking Somebody had a near-death experience, traumatic accident, and then a friend died of cancer. He came to this person two times after the death and then another time, two or three weeks later, to show gratitude. I don't know if it was in a dream or in meditation or if this person saw it in their waking state, but anyway, this kind of experience is, is, is not uncommon. And when you're a monk, you probably hear more about it than other people. So should I be spending time contemplating uh, this death? Because I've already been contemplating it a lot. This changed my life. I live with gratitude. And I realize that doing things for a dying person can create wholesome effects for that person. So... The point of death reflection, you know, the benefits of death reflection are many and one of the benefits is that you live a very skillful life and that you feel gratitude, that's one of the benefits. But there are many benefits and they're progressively deeper and more subtle. The Buddha said that, uh, he asked Ananda how often Ananda contemplated death and I think Ananda contemplated it three times a day, every morning, every afternoon and every evening, which to us would seem fairly diligent. And the Buddha said, that's not enough, Ananda. You should contemplate death with every breath. So this, was, this is understanding that the insight into impermanence is the thing which generates even more merit than a peaceful mind, insight into impermanence. And uh, it's preparing the mind, it's cutting away at delusion because we do the latent tendency to grasp at things to be permanent and want them to be permanent is very, very deep. So we, we have to cut away at it very diligently by just reminding ourselves, you could die today. I do this, if ever I get on a plane, I really do. You might not make it to the end of the runway, Ajahn, I say it. Once you're in the air, you might not make it to your destination. When the plane's landing, you might not, you might not get out of this plane. And I try to do it when I get in cars, just to, because this is a, I think many people are reborn as ghosts or get stuck because they weren't ready when they died. So most people when they get in a car, they're not thinking they might die, they're thinking about the other place they're going. And then death in car accidents usually very fast. So many people aren't ready. And uh, apparently I heard Ajahn Biak said to one person that he doesn't open his divine eye faculty when he drives anymore because everywhere he go, he got a bit bored with seeing kind of praetors holding up their hands asking for merit wherever he went. There's a lot of car accidents and a lot of death in Thailand. And uh, he didn't say it to me, so I can't, uh, but he, another monk told me, so it, it's, you know, one has to be ready to die. And, and if that happens to be in a car accident, you've got like a couple of seconds to kind of, this is it. And, uh, and try as, as best as you can to let go with as much clarity as you can and as much willingness as you can and go to the next life. So uh, death meditation is always valuable and it, it's good if it can be practiced daily, prepares the mind for insight, helps us to live heedfully. The other thing though is it needs to be balanced. But so in, instead of, in the West they're really into contemplating death as a kind of a psychological process and a, a, a way, you know, to help us live a really beautiful life. It should also be understood as, you know, a calming practice, a samatha practice. So when one contemplates death properly, thoughts slow down, less and less thoughts, and an experience of peace. 
and it's afterwards that you can start to think about how to live your life skillfully. But during the death contemplation, you're just trying to you're aiming for that sense of clarity and serenity and stillness and letting go of attachments. So that's always valuable. No, no matter how grateful we are for life, that, that as a summer to practice, and then we understand that the peaceful mind, energy that you can get from a peaceful mind, supports insight. So you take the energy, then the mind becomes peaceful, and similarly, as I was just saying, then you contemplate the body. Contemplate three characteristics. Once the mind moves from its peacefulness, you put the, put the mind to work and consciously develop wisdom. One more question. Can we send metta to a friend who is hungry for love because he is lacking love from family and friends? Definitely. Uh, so when we do our metta bhavana, yeah, we think about people who are suffering. And uh, we don't need to tell people either that we, we put them in our loving kindness meditation, but sure, if somebody is suffering because they don't feel loved, send them lots of metta and I think even more helpful is if that person themselves uh, is interested in practice to to encourage that person themselves to develop metta because uh, then they won't feel lacking in love if they can generate loving kindness for themselves and also people, you know, it won't happen overnight but if that person could develop a, a discipline around metta practice he'd probably find that more and more people would like would like him and uh, new people will come into his life because the merit of the practice will attract uh, new people. And uh, you know, people with loving kindness are attractive. So I would send metta and I would also dedicate merit and I'd make the wish, may this person also grow in this practice of developing loving kindness. First of all, you're all very naughty for talking so much last night. <laughs> you see that, that it's good to see though, isn't it, how much talking agitates the mind. When it is becoming, probably you, most of what you talked about was probably wholesome as well. I hope so. And uh, <laughs> it, uh, I think, well yes, that's what happens when the mindfulness is with its object. So you're training in sati and then a little bit of samadhi comes because of the consistency of the sati, the samadhi arises, you see. And this is how Ajahn Chah trains us to develop samadhi by being consistently mindful of our object. And then that's when there's a sense of unification. And that, that beginning of unification will be different for different people, like one person was feeling a sense of solidity and seeing light, but other people feel just one, oneness. Other people feel a sense of space, other people feel a sense of right. So this is a, a rapture arising in the mind, and that's what I think was occurring in the, in the hands. It's like just uh, the body, you know, you have a physical body, but then you have, a, the whole thing is actually made of energy. And so quantum physicists have discovered that now, the whole thing is buzzing, and it's actually mostly empty space with a lot of uh, protons spinning around very fast. And uh, so when the mind becomes more sensitive, it begins to feel the body as energy, which it is. The body is energy. And uh, so that can take on many different characteristics. The best thing to do is not do anything with it, just observe it. So if I was you and I experienced that, I would just be aware of the warm tingling in, in, the, in the hand and just watch it. You know, and if it's pleasant, it's okay to enjoy it. It's just kind of know that it's pleasant, know that it's tingling. The more one meditates, you become aware that, that that's not uncommon to have an experience like that. So it might be different parts of the body. But basically it's when the mind gets more sensitive, uh, you become aware that the, the whole body is energy and the mind is energy as well. Yeah. So that's just when the mind is is centered. So it's not going out to sounds. So this is the thing about consciousness, very fast. Ear consciousness goes out to sounds and you think the sound is irritating. But actually in, in mindfulness training it's like you're being conscious of aware of hearing at the ear base, then there's no reaction. 
if if the if the sati is really good and there's some samadhi there, it's just it's just noise. And Ajahn Chah would say that he said, people come and say the noise is disturbing me, and he would say, don't disturb the noise, because that's what we do. So we we send the mind out to it, and then we get upset. So it's a very clear pointing to uh, making us take responsibility for our reactivity. But it's a good sign, and. Uh, this is the value of these intensive retreats is you you know at some point we all go through hell in a week i think most people go through some pretty hellish mind states and that's normal and then in the very same day you in heaven <laughs> and that's a very good contemplation isn't it of see how the mind is, is creating realities and so much we would think about it usually and conceptualize about it, we want to understand it. We don't need to do that, actually. It's more about just knowing when it's pleasant, it's pleasant. When it's unpleasant, it's unpleasant. Just staying with that knowing. And, uh, but anyway, I'm happy for you, uh, the insight. The really important thing is when you make a commitment, so you've made a commitment to see it through to the re- end of the retreat, that's really important. Because if you leave, like you've left this morning, that would affect your perception of the whole time. But if you go through it, you have some insights, you have some calm, you see, oh no, it really is true. You can, you, we shouldn't believe our mind state so much because they do arise and cease. And uh, similar with the pain, if we're not reacting to it, if we're just right there with it, that it what you're saying is you, you felt good. So what that is, is uh, where, there's, where there's good mindfulness, even when there's a lot of pain, a mind with a lot of mindfulness is experiencing well-being. It's like it's almost like the nature of the mind. Uh, if it doesn't have a lot of delusion or ignorance present, is pleasant. So it's like this is a, a really good thing to. This is really optimistic news. This is good news. That basically, if you, the more we can drop our confusion and our reactions, the more bliss there is in the mind. So. Uh, yeah, and then you can investigate pain and see it. And that's the other thing is with it, when there's some wisdom as well. Any of these uh, factors of enlightenment, they're pleasant. The other thing to pay attention to is that whenever there's a kilesa in the mind, any form of greed, any form of hatred is unpleasant. So when delusion is present, we don't see that because we're thinking about that bit of pleasure that we think we'll get when we get the thing we want or if someone's upset us, that bit of pleasure we get when we get that little bit of revenge you know, say the thing that you want to, that nasty thing, you know, that kind of delusions that function in the mind. But if you have mindfulness present, you have a look what that's like in the heart, it's really painful. And uh, if uh, this mindfulness knowing pain as pain, as a feeling, as a feeling, and watching it arise and cease, there's a lot of happiness in the mind. So good. Did anyone else during, uh, during this time so far have an experience of a very painful mind state going away quickly? and then uh, becoming quite peaceful in the same day. Did anyone else have that experience? Very good. Has anyone else uh, been able to watch pain uh, with some equanimity and uh, peacefulness? Acceptance, okay, good. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. There's one other thing I'd like yeah. to add as well. Yes. I want, want to ask you is when you were observing uh, when the breath was, while well, mind was on with the breath, was there any sense of joy being there at that time? A sense of joy, a sense of you. Was there any personality present in that experience? No. Similarly, when uh, the pain, when your mind is with the pain, watching it ceasing, just pain, and just mindfulness of the pain. Okay, this is very important because sometimes beginning meditators, afterwards it becomes, I was experiencing, I was experiencing. That's normal because we have these conventions, but it's very important to understand that it was the degree to which you weren't being a self in that moment that you are able to experience that peace. Because the self is a kind of a delusion, a conceiving as my peace, my my rapture. So very important to to remember that point that and it's normal, we like to tell our experiences, it's expiring, it's it's good to share. 
But then the important thing to remember is that it was because mindfulness was really strong and because we weren't having conceptions about self and other that the clarity in the mind was strong enough to really be there present. So that's just another another thing to keep in mind. You can dedicate merit now. Now the chance of us is of sharing and aspiration through the goodness that arises from my practice. May my spiritual teachers and eyes of great virtue, my mother, my father, and my relatives, the sun and the moon, and all virtuous leaders of the world, may the highest God and the evil forces my 